Hi, I'm here with Ian Perry for some more cricket history. Ian, how are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, thanks. How about yourself? I'm good, I'm good. Apart from the fact that I let you down last week, I didn't do a formal introduction for you. So to our viewers, I do apologise. So Ian, without further ado, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your sort of you know, upbringing with cricket, if, if you don't mind, and your journey to date within cricket. Um, well, I think, um, I think probably the, the, the overriding word for all of that would be mediocrity. Um, I, I came, in, came into cricket via probably the classic route of um, becoming involved with my local club initially as scorer. Um, so I ended up scoring for the first team or playing for the thirds and then seconds and firsts. Um, and then university and then um, working through the 80s, uh, well, sorry, 90s, um, and onwards, I was working in the Thames Valley and playing for different clubs, so Maidenhead, Taplow, um, Bracknell, and playing league cricket, um, usually as wicketkeeper or opening batsman. Um, as I say, taking t- <laughs> t- 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 turning um, turning mediocrity into an art form, um, <laughs> and. Then after a couple of years away from the game, mostly for family reasons, I came back into it via um, wandering cricket. And I'm now exclusively involved with various wandering clubs. Um, and I don't play any league cricket at all. Uh, do, you, do, you miss any, do you miss any of those league cricket days? Not really, because um, what, I, what I love now about the game is the kind of that slightly more relaxed approach where you, you don't want to lose you, um, or rather you, you still play and do your best but your enjoyment of the game in the moment takes over from the, the kind of the competitive drive so your your enjoyment is still very much based on doing well but you'd rather lose a good game an enjoyable game where everybody's had actually had a really good time yeah. you'd rather lose that than scrape out a boring draw which might be more points for the league but would be an awful lot less enjoyable that's brilliant and, and I mean so really you've, you've played you've been a lifelong fan and player of the game and, and really yeah. now you're just at that stage where it's, it's, it's just to enjoy and, and make sure that you get a full day out exactly that my um, my first memories of, of playing cricket, apart from the usual thing of um, hitting a ball around in the garden with um, with my brother, um, was I actually got into proper cricket, organised cricket, um, simply as a um, an excuse to to get out of having to do track and field athletics at <laughs> <in> school. <laughs> That sounds like a good plan to me, and I think I did something similar. In fact, I think I remember a time when when the uh, captain of athletics. <laughs> assumed I was going to be doing 1500 metre running and I told him that I was a cricket player so there was no chance I was going to be available. I, I blagged it completely. I, um, I, I went to the, um, the, the master who's, who's actually looking after the athletics and said, uh, please sir, Mr Bynan said I can go and join the cricket squad and then ran off the cricket squad. And, um, please sir, Mr Hughes said I could come and join the cricket squad. <laughs> and that was that. The rest is history. Yes, and speaking absolutely. of history then, Ian, so what have you got for us today? I think we've got a, a section on game-changing women. I wonder what you've managed to uncover. Yes, um, I was doing a little bit of digging through... I mean, one of my favourite sources is John Major's absolutely brilliant book, More Than Just a Game. I found um, a lovely reference in 1741 to Sarah Cadogan, the second Duchess of Richmond, um, and Charlie Lennox, the second Duke of Richmond, and um, the, the Duchess are known across the game as some of the, um, the a couple of the, the very early patrons of the game and very important in the, the early building of some momentum behind the game. Um, but she was also um, a very enthusiastic sponsor of, of women's cricket. And there's one, one of the earliest references is in 1741. Um, so it's really early in the, the establishment of the game as an organised activity. Um, this is between um, Slindon and East Dean, absorbed now into one of the villages in Hampshire. Okay. Um, and then 1741, the Whitehall Evening Post referred to a game that was sponsored by her. 
Um, the uh, <coughs> um, Elizabeth Smith Stanley, the Countess of Derby, was another um, very keen player um, about 30 years later. And um, she apparently sponsored an 11 to play against um, the Ladies of Quality and Fashion oh, at um, the Oaks at Woodmanstone in, in Surrey, um, which I, I think is marvellous. Um, but then the probably the most famous of the the early female um, game changers was um, Christiana Hodges or Christiana Willis as she was originally um, and she and her brother John are credited with um, being one of the more, the more instrumental actors um, in bringing round arm bowling into the game um, they um, Apparently, Tom Walker at the Hambledon Club had actually been the first um, purveyor of, of round-arm bowling about 20 years before, but it, it kind of died out quite rapidly yeah. um, because I think because it was so radical, it, it was too too radical for its time. And the, um, the story goes in around about the, um, the start of the 19th century that Christiana and John would actually use um, a barn as an impromptu net and um, she would bowl to him and, and apparently they trained the dog to field the ball. Oh, fantastic. What a great <laughs> use of a dog for those dog lovers fantastic. out there. Fantastic. <laughs> and then that lovely line that um, um, Christiana, John and the dog could take on any 11 in England and probably... Love the, I, the, the problem with round arm bowling in those days, of course, because it was so radical, it was... Um, and it gave the, the bowler such an advantage. Um, it was deemed to be a little bit too much. And for about 25 to 30 years, um, there was something of a, um, a friction around this. John Willis went on to um, take part in a game in 1822 at Lords between Kent and the MCC, um, where he was constantly no-balled for bowling round arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, to the point where he said, right, that's it, I'm off. So, he left the field of play, got into his carriage and never touched the ball again, apparently. Oh, wow. It sounds like a sort of a Daryl Hare, <laughs> Murley moment, that, doesn't it, really? It does, rather. It does. The point is not lost that Christiana and, and John, between them, obviously as part of the, what, you know, two of the early pioneers of round-arm bowling, um, their place in history is, is pretty much immutable. Um, there was the suggestion that Christiana bowled round arm because she um, she couldn't actually bowl underarm wearing a hooped skirt. Yeah. Which is a lovely idea, apart from the fact that hooped skirts were no longer in fashion in those days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think it's um, it's more a case of the, the realisation, particularly after one or two people had done it before, that um, if they actually perfected it and worked at it, then it could be... Um, an in incredibly powerful um, addition to your armory. Lily Poulet Harris in Tasmania, um, who was probably the the pioneer of women's cricket in Australia and founded the first club in um, Oyster Cove in Tasmania um, in 1894, wow. um, which was the first ladies cricket club in Australia. Of course, any any mention of women in cricket, um, and particularly those who changed the game, you, you cannot um, failed to mention Rachel Hayhoe Flint, yep. of course, who um, I think Shield Berry described, described her as the WG Grace of the women's game. And she did so much to um, effectively to, to make the game um, recognisable as something that women could do and be competitive um, and actually play to a, a really high standard. Yeah. Um, and uh, a, a, an international playing career of over 20 years speaks volumes. Yeah, that's an amazing achievement for any player, isn't it? That? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's excellent. It's excellent. And I mean, you know, just even more recently, uh, I remember Charlotte Edwards being a massive pioneer for, for the England women's team yeah. and, and those around her. Claire Taylor, I think, is the all time leading run scorer. I might yes. that. Yeah, I believe so. But, you know, and, and, um, and, and of course, um, Sarah Taylor, probably one of the best keepers if, if not certainly the best in the women's game and, and quite genuinely one of the best in, in the world game now yeah 
Yeah, some of her takes standing up are really <sighs> amazing for those that haven't seen her. Astonishing. She's she has the reactions of a housefly. Yeah, no, it is She's amazing. Incredibly it's, fast. It's great to sort of hear in, I guess, the journey, and I know there have been a lot of women, you know, not that long ago, really um, having to battle, unfortunately, for their kind of opportunities in cricket, which is is sad to hear. But ultimately, now, hopefully by the, the foundations laid by these people and the efforts they went to in order to, to play and, and to grow the game. Uh, you know, hopefully now we're coming the other side of that tunnel where there's much more opportunities and it's far wider spread and, and uh, you know, grows the game as we want it to grow. Yeah, yeah. The thing that um, to me really stands out there is the, the roots of women's cricket are as, as buried as deep as the roots of men's cricket. Yeah, and it's a really um, interesting take. In fact, you've highlighted a couple that, that even I've never really considered, uh, just in this short passage now. And, you yeah. know, I think it's it's a great opportunity, I suppose, and a great place to, to sort of leave this week's history uh, podcast because we who knows what's coming to the future and who knows, you know, who what, what we'll be saying in another 20 years' time around... Indeed where the game has gone especially for, for women and, and it's thanks a lot to these these women who, who changed the game yeah. you know hundreds absolute, of years ago absolute trailblazers for our viewers each week we'll be looking to do some level of family tale or moment in time Ian what have you got for us this yes. week a moment in time something that prompted uh, me to to think of uh, albeit a, a slightly tenuous link to the sad news about um, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, if you cast your mind back to 1953 and Christmas, um, on Christmas Eve there was a, a, a horrible disaster in New Zealand. Bridge collapse at Tangiwai and a train going over it at the time, um, which led to, I think it was 151 people very, very sadly killed. Um, as it happened, the newly crowned Queen and Duke of Edinburgh were actually in New Zealand at the time. At the same time as the disaster, New Zealand were playing South Africa um, in a test match, which started on Christmas Day, which was when the news broke. Um, and then on Boxing Day, um, the the game resumed. And even, <laughs> even more tragic, one of the New Zealand players, Bob Blair, his fiancée was one of those who was killed in the crash. Oh, no. And so, obviously, over, over the, the rest day, it was announced that he would withdraw from the game, quite understandably. Um, when the game started on Boxing Day, the South African opening bowler, Neil Adcock, in his first tour, uh, sorry, his first um, test series, bowling very quickly on what was proving to be a very lively pitch, um, was getting the ball to rear. Um, he hit pretty much every one of the New Zealand batsmen. Um, a couple of them were bowled off the body onto the stumps. Um, he hit Laurie Miller, who is the, I think, number five batsman on the chest, forced him to retire hurt. He was coughing blood. Yeah. Um, he hit Bert Sutcliffe, who is the, the left-handed number four batsman, um, hit him on the side of the head, third ball of his innings, and knocked him out. He, he, he then retired hurt. So there's two, two of the top batsmen in hospital already, and with another player out of the side. So the innings cascading into ruins. When the sixth wicket fell, obviously everybody then thought, right, that's it, the end of the innings, and started to walk off, only to see Laurie Miller coming walking out, having been strapped up and dragged himself from hospital um, to come out and carry on his innings. He hung around for about another 45 minutes, made a really brave, really gritty 14 before he was out. And then, of course, everybody started walking off again, only to then see Bert Sutcliffe walking out. <laughs> the again, resurrection he's come from hospital. Seems... He's swathed in bandages, almost looking like a Sikh. Yeah. Um, there's so much bandage he's still bleeding from the side of his head and he he started to fade to, to carry on his his innings he took the view possibly augmented by a certain amount of um scottish spirit as opposed to dutch courage um to he probably felt that he he couldn't really just try and push and prod and poke it around 
but um, try and fight fire with fire. But then his partner, I can't remember who the, the non-striker, but the, the other batsman was, he was out. And so, of course, everybody starts walking off again, thinking that's it. And everything stopped. Everything went absolutely silent. The whole of Johannesburg ground went silent because the person walking out to bat was Bob Blair. And he came out to bat. All the the New Zealand players in the changing room watching with tears flooding down their faces. The South Africans, not much better. And Sutcliffe walked up to him, put his arm around him and said, this is no place for us. Let's just give it away. Let's get on with it and see what happens. And they, I'm getting emotional even just telling you this. Um, They took 25, which was then the world record for a number of runs off and over. Wow. from one over from Tayfield. And Sutcliffe hit him for three straight sixes, straight back over his head, bang, 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 took a single, and then Blair hit one over mid-wicket. The only scoring shot of his innings was a six over mid-wicket. They took 25 off that one over. They added 35 in literally about 12 balls before um, before Blair was out, leaving Sutcliffe not out, 80. My, and, and all of those 80 runs having been made after he got hit on the head, bleeding still. Um, and as they walked off, the whole place just erupted. And and at that moment, as they walked off, and Sutcliffe just stood back to let Blair go, go through in front of him, through the gate, and they went off, arms around each other's shoulders into the tunnel. That's a moment in time. Brilliant. Brilliant, Ian. Ian, it's been brilliant to have you this week. Can't wait till next week. You take care. My pleasure. All the best. Cheers, bud. Bye.